Okay, folks, we might uh, kick this session off. This is uh, Siva Kaczynski and Ariel Magolas. I hope I've got those pronounced right. And they're going to give us a presentation about disrupting the classroom, just what connected learning really means for your classroom. <coughs> so uh, we'll just, uh, yep, I've started the recording. And there's a message from our sponsors who are sponsoring this whole show, Blackboard Collaborate, the Australia E-Series. Cyber Academy, uh, Shambles, and Coach Carroll uh, are also uh, genera uh, you know, giving their time and, uh, and resources to this and the learning uh, revolution as well. So uh, if people would like to grab one of those small icons there, uh, the smiley face or the other little green dot, and just drag it to where you are in the world, please, so to give people some idea of just whereabouts in the world that you are. So, uh, so just simply uh, use your mouse and drag one of those little icons around so we can see exactly where people are in, in the world. Okay, so we've got four people in the States by the look of it. And um, one, I know there's another couple in Australia there if they haven't uh, put their faces across there first. Okay, so well, uh, cannot drag. Well, okay. Can't explain that one. Uh, you should be able to. Have a look at that. Oh, hang on. Whiteboard. You didn't have whiteboard privileges. Should be able to drag it now. Uh, then. Okay. Global permissions were set, and uh, and we couldn't drag it across. So yep. So we went over there in Western Australia. Okay. So we'll move on from there and uh, loaded the slides, so I'll hand it over to you, uh, Asiva and Ariel. Take it away. Thank you so much for the intro, Keith, and welcome, everybody. It's, it's a pleasure to have you here, and, and I'm honored that you're joining us. It's, it's an intimate crowd, so we can have a great conversation. My name is Sieva Kaczynski. I'm the CEO and founder of StudySuit. Um, you can tweet at me at Sieva Kaczynski while we're talking here. Um, I run an Educators and Influencers series, um, where we talk to educators, influencers, and experts in the space. So a lot of the conversation that we're having today, um, we'll be referencing some of the exa examples and stories um, that have come from these sessions, and, and I think those will be very interesting to you all. Um, Ariel, would you like to take a moment to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Eva. Uh, I'm Ariel Margolis. I'm an eighth grade science teacher. I'm also an adjunct lecturer at uh, Hebrew College uh, and also an ed tech uh, fanatic. Love to bring uh, education technology into the classroom. I've uh, been teaching at uh, Kahila Schechter Academy in Norwood, Massachusetts uh, for over 15 years. Just started teaching at the college level at Hebrew College and the Pardes Institute uh, starting in January. Excellent. Thank you so much. And um, we're going to be answering a few main questions today. This is going to be very much an interactive presentation. So we'll be going over some of these three questions. We'll be offering some examples as well. And then for the last 15 to 20 minutes or so, Ariel and I are going to go through a bit of a Q&A, and that way Ariel can answer some of the questions that you might have um, and that I'll ask him about the technology use in his classroom and some of the successes that he's actually seen in person. Um, I will definitely turn to you, the crowd, to, to actually add your own examples. If uh, partway through the presentation you feel like you have a good example of your own application in real life or with students or in the classroom of, of the conversation that we're having, then please do offer, um, offer the example to the rest of the people. I think it's very useful to share examples and stories in this way. Um, it's really the best way of learning. So I think you have a feature where you can raise your hand um, or you can go in the chat window and, and put out your question or say you'd like to uh, say something, and Keith will give you those privileges. Um, the next one. So here's, here are some of the questions that we're going to try to answer today. What does learning look like when technology is a primary driver in education? What is working and failing today in the use of technology applications? And finally, where does the teacher fit into this whole process? So let's go ahead and jump straight to our first question. What does learning look like when technology is a primary driver in education? You'll see that I don't, I don't like to use a lot of words on my slides, and 
I'll just be giving examples and telling you a little bit about this. So let me know if any questions come up. So let's take a look first about what learning is not. And this slide right here is not the future of learning with technology. What you see here are students um, almost drone-like with their use of, of technology in front of computers. There's no interaction. There's no collaboration. And even though I don't want to spend too much time on this, it's important to show you this because a lot of us have this image of the future of education as students consuming content and lectures and filling out uh, information on their computers, um, similar to what you might imagine out of straight out of 19, the book 1984 with Big Brother controlling us all. Um, and this really isn't it. Um, and, and the reason it's not it is because we have to think of the global use of internet and technology in our daily lives, which is really, which is really focused around easier, faster, and delivery at a larger scale, right? That's how the, the internet is used. So we can imagine that in, in education, we're going to see the same type of application of technology. We already see that today. Some example companies that have been really successful that we can take a look at are Craigslist, which has made classifieds better, Google Scholar, which has organized academic research, and Skype, which has created instant communication. So these are all things that we already want to do. They're not creating new behaviors. They're not creating any new ideas. Um, so we have to keep this in mind when we're evaluating the future of learning and the future of technology and education. So what is the future, you might ask, and where is education going? Uh, we have to take a look at what are the things we like to do today in education. And those really are um, three, they really breaks down into three main things. People love to learn. They love to collaborate, and they love to interact. All of these things, all of these elements bring satisfaction to humans. We as beings are interactive and collaborative by nature, and we love learning. We love passing on information. So the role of the internet and technology is going to be really to augment these three elements. It's not going to be to replace the teacher in any sense. It's really going to be to position uh, students in the best way possible to augment learning, collaboration, and interaction, especially in an age where information is abundant. The future of technology and learning with technology is going to be greater collaboration, greater access, and new, new possibilities. And we're going to use this presentation to look at some of these um, different opportunities. So moving right along, um, what is working and failing today with the use of technology in the classroom? So this is where we'll take a look at some of the examples from our experts and speakers and teachers that we, that we uh, interact with. Um, and later in the conversation, um, Ariel might even offer some of his own um, expertise in the subject. And this is definitely a section where if anybody in the crowd has used technology in their classroom or with their students, I invite you to speak up um, and let us know, because we'd love to hear from you. So the first example we have for you about using technology effectively in the classroom to, to break down the walls, to flatten the classroom, um, is an example from a gentleman named Thomas Murray and Joe Mazza. Um, these are some of our guests that we've had uh, there bloggers, they're educators, they're influencers in the space, and they're really on the forefront of delivering education uh, and, and showing the world how technology should be used in the classroom. And our example um, here actually won the EduBlog Award for Best Use of Technology this year, which is very, very impressive, and, and I'm sure you'll recognize this as such. The, Thomas and Joe actually participated and had their classrooms participate in a cross-state debate. So having classroom debates is a very normal uh, part of our activities. It's something that most classrooms probably do. I certainly did it when I was younger. And then we get used to debating with our teammates or debating in front of the class or maybe even the class down the hall. Joe and Thomas took it to a whole new level. They did a cross-state debate between Pennsylvania and New Jersey about the topic of whether homework is effective or not. They used Google Hangout as their um, Ian said he cannot see. Um, we're not actually showing anything, Ian. We're just, uh, we're just going through the actual concept of, of the cross-state debate. But going back to it, um, they used Google Hangout as their tool, and they actually involved four schools. So they had two schools in Pennsylvania, 
and two schools in New Jersey, which collaborated within the state to debate against the other school. So they had a live chat going where they could interact and discuss what would, they could really collaborate in real time, what would the next topic be. This was a particularly cool event because these kids were so excited. Can you imagine uh, competing against a different state? The stakes were higher, the research was better, the interest was greater, and this is all from the eyes of the teacher himself, Thomas, who put on the event in collaboration with Joe and a handful of other people. To judge the event, we, uh, they had Shannon Miller and Will Richardson, uh, leading, leading individuals in the ed tech space, um, which again is really exciting. It's something that we were not able to do before these technologies were available. So this is a fantastic um, example of flattening the classroom, leveraging technology to engage students, get them involved, um, and really open the doors to new opportunities. If anybody has any examples like this that they've actually experienced using technology, Skype, Google Hangouts, or Twitter, we would love to hear it. Um, Ariel, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, your use of, of technology to flatten the classroom, maybe across state borders or even internationally? I think you mentioned that you did some work with Israel as well. Sure. Um, for over a decade, uh, our school has um, had a long-term relationship with a high school in Haifa called the Aroni Gimel School. And through the, originally, originally from the Bureau of Jewish Education and now funded by um, the Boston Haifa grant uh, through CJP, we are able to have our eighth graders and their ninth graders collaborate on a science project. Um, and through the use of technology, most recently last year we used uh, Google Hangout, the students were able to collaborate um, together uh, on the projects and be able to communicate and share documents together uh, in a way that was very meaningful and also very uh, rich as well. Um, the reason why we chose science as a, as a medium to connect the two groups, if you will, is that it's a neutral topic. And as a Jewish day school, our students are taught about the Jewish culture, history, um, as well, and the language um, in the state of Israel. But we really want them to connect, and, and research has shown that when they have a, re a really strong connection to somebody in Israel, and most likely somebody close to their age, and they get to see just how similar they are, the similar likes and dislikes, the likes in music, the likes in food, in clothing, um, and then they get to work together on a neutral topic that has nothing to do with, with politics, has nothing to do with government or any of the issues that are going on in either country. Um, the students form a strong bond, and our alumni have proven that uh, the stronger the connection, the more likely that our students will visit one another. We've had students from Israel come to um, the United States to visit their former uh, partners and vice versa. And over 60% of our alumni um, who participated in this program um, have gone to Israel for a second time or more either in their high school career, college career, or afterward. Um, and it's, and it's through the use of technology, originally through email, and now through Google Hangout, which brings the, the person r basically right to your screen. Um, and it makes for a much more meaningful conversation, much more meaningful collaboration uh, amongst the two parties. That's a fantastic story. That's, that's exactly the use of technology as we foresee it. Uh, how we want people using technology to become connected learners and to really break down the walls of their classroom. That's, that's, that's an awesome example, Ariel. Thank you for sharing. Um, so we just, we just looked at some examples, and, and others, of course, include the idea that you can now follow the Twitter of a president. And I know that when I studied French history, maybe we learned a little bit about the French Revolution or what was going on currently in France. But now when I come back to my high school, and it's, it's really amazing to, to watch them and see them interact with, with uh, politicians in France. For instance, they were following President Alons when he was visiting the U.S. And these students who are um, eighth or ninth grade, they're, they can tweet at President Alon. They can see a response. They can see minute or hourly updates as to what, what he's doing while he's in the States. It's really an amazing opportunity. Um, so now that we've looked at some examples, you might be wondering, 
you know, how could you potentially get started? Sometimes uh, people who, who might be listening to this have had very little to no uh, use of technology in their, in their classroom or their education. Um, and we can take a look at an example uh, who's Principal Eric Schenninger. He's out of New Jersey. Um, and he's a very, um, very well-known individual and, and expert in the, ed tech, in the education technology space. And you can actually see his interview on our website. That's blog.studysuit.com. But he talks about his story, how he was not a connected learner. He was really against learning with technologies and, and really thought that technology was actually a distraction and a safety risk at his school. Um, and, and we can see him grow. Today he's actually written a book on digital leadership, um, which we'll share with you later. And he, the interesting thing that he talks about, and it's a, it's a bit comical because he was on a show in the U.S. called The Principal's Office. So forever and ever there's video of him online showing, uh, there's video of him in the show showing him taking away devices of students, lambasting social media, and, and really the opposite image of who he is today. So he's, he's an example of someone who's gone from the ultimate extreme of being against social media or against devices to really becoming a pioneer and a leader in space. Um, and, and the way he did it is very interesting, and he talks about it personally, um, but we'll summarize it here. Basically, he really just started with Twitter. One day he was reading um, a magazine on the use of technology in classroom, and he says, in his own words, he says, I was saying blah, 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 very, very negative responses to the article he was reading until towards the end he realized that he could use this free tool, Twitter, to actually interact with his stakeholders. Uh, that's teachers, uh, students, professors. So he said he would try it out, and that's where, really where he started. He would post messages, and his quote-unquote stakeholders, as he called them, would receive these messages. So that's how he started. He just picked one thing that he wanted to do with Twitter and, and moved on from there. And all of a sudden, he says, he found himself looking and looking in at what other people were doing and actually inadvertently educating himself on uses of technology in other people's schools as well as connecting with other educators. So that's an example of, of uh, Principal Eric Scheninger who went from hating technology, removing technology from his classroom, thinking that it was the worst thing ever, to really becoming an avid, uh, an avid fan, really, of technology and, and the importance of it in his classrooms. And he's actually brought it to all of his teachers at his school now. So this, this slide is really just to show you that although we might picture technology playing this role of an assessment engine or a lecture replacement, it really isn't. Um, in our current state, it might make sense to take, uh, to take information from a physical assessment to a digital assessment and maybe film lectures, but that's not really where um, the primary role of technology is going to be, and that's not really what we're excited about. We're really excited about um, the connected learner and, and the role of the teacher in this whole connected opportunity. And we'll actually talk to Ariel in a little bit about his personal role um, in the classroom and how he's being a connected learner and, and the use of his technology in class. So the last question that, we're, that we'll discuss a little bit is, is how do you as a teacher fit into the, the future of ed tech and learning? Um, how do you position yourself? And, and we touched upon this a little bit with, with the example of Eric uh, just a couple minutes ago. Um, the future is really about you. It's really about you as, an, as a teacher becoming a connected learner. Because if you can become a connected learner, if you can become fluent in the application of technologies, then, it is, then you can automatically become a teacher. Um, so Eric says you need to become a connected learner your, in your, yourself. You need to invest in your personal learning network. So get on Twitter, get on blogs, put yourself out there because you'll be really surprised by the type of people you can interact with, the type of people you can meet. Um, with the use of Skype and Twitter put together, you can meet someone, you can interact with them over video, and all of a sudden you have a virtual friend, maybe in a different country, maybe in a different state. Um, it's no longer about just face-to-face -face interactions and being in the same room. Furthermore, you must be an expert in the process. And, and you might wonder what that means. You really need to be able to 
guide your student, help your student achieve any goal that they set. So a lot of education right now is moving towards project-based learning, and we'll talk about that a little later with Ariel as well. Your role as a teacher is to really guide your students in the troubleshooting in the path towards learning. Because learning, um, I mean, Ray Raymond Kurzweil says, education should be learning by doing. So project-based learning is becoming a, a much more important forward-facing element in the classroom. And you must become the expert in that process and, again, invest in your personal learning network. So just to summarize it, um, blogging on Twitter is a must. Help turn your students into problem solvers by you first becoming an expert. Push them to discover new tools and mediums. And again, coming back to that personal learning network. Get on Twitter, get on blogs, start lurking, start creeping, start looking around and see what might be useful to you and really become a professional in the space so you can become the teacher that students want to have and that districts want to have. And at the end of the day, we would like to have a picture like this where everybody's at connected learning. Peer-to-peer -peer learning is a must. And uh, we look forward to a future like this. So in the second part of this presentation, uh, we're going to talk to Ariel Margolis, who introduced himself earlier. So for anybody who's, who's just joining on, Ariel is a teacher of eighth grade as well as college. And he's a, a, a very um, powerful user of technology, I should say. He's almost tech geeky, I like to say. He started a couple years back when it was still unknown. And today he's going to talk a little bit about his experiences. Um, and we're just going to dive into some questions. We're going to do a little Q&A here live. Feel free to let, to let us know if you have any questions. And go ahead and put it in the chat window. Um, so, Ariel, just real quickly, would you introduce yourself um, one more time in just a couple of words? And then we'll dive into your use of technology in the classroom. Sure. I, I like the term uh, ed tech geek. It's, uh, <laughs> I'll make a t-shirt out of it. Um, I've been teaching for 15 years uh, at Kehoe Sector Academy, eighth grade science. Um, last year, I became the ed tech coach uh, for the school, one of the ed tech coaches for the school. Uh, and I'm also just started teaching a college grad course um, for Hebrew College and the Pardes Institute uh, in Israel to train teachers to enter the Jewish day schools uh, in the United States and Canada. Um, and uh, two years ago, I started flipping my class. And um, just from an email that my head of school sent me, and um, it's really been a, a very interesting journey um, to how my class is now structured to what has been described as either organized chaos or it's been called also like a, a Google workplace um, where kids are, are working on multiple projects, working in multiple teams, um, and working at his or her own pace and their own, using their own learning style and that they, they basically choose their path um, to, in order to meet the goals and to learn the skills that they need to become connected learners, um, as Sieva was saying. That, um, you know, we also want to model, teachers need to model, be our good, mo our good models for their students. And just as we want uh, teachers to be connected learners, we want our students to be connected learners as well. Um, and so what better way to connect them through Google Hangouts and other technologies that are out there to connect with other students and other experts in the field. Ariel, I'm really happy that you mentioned your beginnings in the flipped flip learning model and you even mentioned the word journey. That's fantastic because I'd like to learn a little bit more, or I'm sure we'd all like to learn, uh, about your journey. What, what has changed for you as far as your role as a teacher since that first day or class where you started the flip classroom model, you weren't quite sure what it was, you ventured into the unknown, and, and where are you today? Maybe walk us through some of those steps or some of, the, um, some of that journey, please. Sure, absolutely. Um, so before I, I flipped, um, I was really what, what they call the sage on stage. I was the one that was delivering the content to the students. Um, and you know I was bringing in technology here and there. Um, I was one of the first teachers to use email as a way to communicate with students outside of class. Um, I was also using the AOL uh, instant messaging to communicate with students. Um, but in the classroom, it was very um, frontal teaching. We did have you know, projects where everyone was doing the same project and everyone had to finish at the same time. Um, and then when I flipped, um, I made, I started by making my own videos, um, having students watch them 
at night and then come in and then work on the assignments that theoretically would be done at home but also would be done in school. Um, and through the, through the process, I discovered that, um, which something I already knew, but the, the results were actually right in front of me, students learn at a different pace. And they also have different styles of learning. So for some students, doing a hands-on experiment to learn the concept of molecular bonding was the way to go for that particular student, whereas someone else would just want to read an article about it. And another person would want to watch a video about it. And another person would want to have a conversation with someone who um, works with molecular bonding uh, in a company. And what came out of it was that I now give my students a roadmap with the specific goals um, for them. Um, almost every student now has uh, an individualized and personalized goals um, for a particular unit in chemistry or in physics. And they are able to choose their own path. And by that, I mean they choose the specific activities that they are interested in um, in pursuing, whether it's learning the complexities of protein denaturation in, uh, in chocolate and in egg whites or, you know, understanding how to balance chemical equations. Um, in the end, they all end up basically in the same place um, where they have met the goals that I set for them and goals that are set by their team at, at the school. Um, and it has become, what's, I guess, what's called asynchronous learning where kids are working at their own paces, um, they're forming, they're working in multiple groups depending on what project they're, they're on or what subject they're on. And um, it, it seems a little bit like organized chaos, but there's a lot of learning going on. And for the first time um, that I can imagine, the, um, by November, my students had met all the criteria for the Massachusetts standards for science for their grade. And anywhere from 60 to 70 percent of the National Common Core standards uh, for the United States in science um, just through November, which is amazing um, given that, you know, we, we struggle to get to to cover everything. Um, so I'm, I'm constantly bringing in, one of the things that I'm working on this year is to bring in new types of technologies and to expose the students to different types of technologies and let them explore um, what's, what's out there and to also connect with the people behind those technologies, the development teams or the CEOs of companies and let them communicate with them and for the, and for the students to understand that they're actually part of the process. That when we try out a new system or we try out a beta system, I tell them that they're the guinea pigs and the development team wants to know how their, you know, how their product works and what could be made better in order to pique the interest of a 14-year-old boy or girl um, or to make the, the tool better for a 14-year-old boy or girl. Um, and uh, it, it's amazing what's coming out of it. The kids are, are excited about coming to school. They're excited about coming to class. They know exactly what they need to do as soon as they sit in the classroom. And, and by sit, I mean some of them are standing, some of them are sitting on the floor, a couple of them are sitting in, in recliners. Um, you know, the, it's, it's really a, an environment of learning that it seems relaxed but can also be seen as very chaotic. But everyone knows what his and her role is, uh, whether they're working alone or in small groups. That's, that's truly inspirational stuff, Ariel. It's so cool to hear the journey and, and the transformation that students are having. And I know that you have a, a really amazing story that, that we'll talk a little bit in a little bit about one of your students in particular and how uh, technology has, has played a huge role in transforming the, the role in the classroom. But tell us this, um, were you at all concerned? You, I mean, you were taking kind of a big risk trying to flip the classroom, trying this new model where, where people supportive. Talk, talk to us about some of the challenges that you face because there's a lot of variables, students, parents, administrators. I'm sure it's overwhelming to try new things. Sometimes you just want to stick with what's working. Um, talk us through some of those steps. Sure. So um, I would say that it was very helpful to have my heads of school support uh, from the beginning um, to flip the class and, and to try it out. I think that that's, you know, that's part of Education 3.0 right now where you get to explore and, and try new things because you're really not, you're not going to irreparably harm a child by trying a new tactic or a new technology. Um, and it's good data and feedback and it's a good way to reflect. 
Um, I would say that the, the two biggest challenges were the students who wanted to be spoon-fed, who, who had been spoon-fed for so many years that their creativity and their passion and their, their, even their way of learning was sucked out of them because they had to learn the specific way that the teacher was teaching them and that they had to, they wanted, they had to get the answer right the first time and if they didn't it meant that they weren't smart enough. Um, and so it was challenging for those students to basically throw it back into their laps and say, no, you can actually do this. I'll help you. I'll guide you. I'll be the guide on the side, but I'm not telling you what to study or how to study. I'll guide you, but you're going to be the one who's going to benefit the most because I recently read in the blog that we, no matter what we call any type of, of, of education dog, whether it's project-based learning or um, authentic-based learning or, or inquiry-based learning, the learning really isn't in our control and the teacher's control. It's in the student's control. Whatever they get out of it, that's what they're going to get out of it. And if we can in, in, entice them to be passionate about it and to be excited about it, then they'll get more out of it. They'll make more connections and it'll, make more, it'll be more real and authentic for them. Um, so that was one of the challenges. The other challenges were from parents who would say, well, you know, how is this preparing my child for high school where they're going to have to take notes and they're going to have to take multiple choice tests and they're going to have to do assessment after assessment. And, um, and the, other, the other piece that, I, that we were fighting is you're not covering every single thing in the curriculum um, that they're going to cover in high school. And I used to try and, and focus on you know, finishing, the, finishing the book. That was the goal, to get through all 24 chapters of the book. Um, and now my focus is on giving the students the skills that they need in order to be students in order to understand how a student learns, that if a student learns through um, and processes information uh, visually, that there are ways that they can use that, use those, um, that knowledge to um, be successful in any course that they take, whether it's in high school, college, or beyond, and, and successful in the workforce. And that they can be passionate about something that they really connect with what they're learning. Um, and so year after year, I get um, reports back from alumni thanking me. Um, you know, I, I don't like to toot my own horn, but they, they literally thank me for teaching them how to learn and how to become a better student. Um, so, and they're more successful at understanding that learning isn't just about memorization and about facts, but it, it's about thinking and it's about processing. It's about metacognitive skills um, and social relational skills that they're going to need in order to be successful uh, in the world today. Um, you know, that's an important piece that, that is starting to also be uh, promoted throughout the school systems. Um, being able to relate to one another and to relate to yourself, um, which is an important uh, feature in learning. So, so Ariel, we actually have a couple questions that have come through here. Um, I, I know I still have a couple more, but Keith asked, do you have students who did not want to participate? If so, what happened to them or, or how did you address some of those? Sure. Um, well, you know, yes, I, I had students who did not want to participate um, initially in, in the structure, um, and I had students who didn't want to participate in anything. They just weren't in, interested in any part of the curriculum that was being offered. Um, and I can talk about uh, a couple of success stories this year that I've had with that that I haven't had before. Um, but in terms of the structure, um, the the, the students who were the, res the most resistant, I would meet with them, and the flipped model allows me to work with each student individually. Um, and I would work with them individually, and it would be you know, sca just like we do with scaffolding with regular teaching. You would show them, okay, this is what I want you to do now, and now I want you to try and find the answer here. And I would use a line that um, one of the, the heads of school, Dr. Nitan Resnick, uses, I say no more, and basically let them be. And so for a couple minutes, they would be anxious or they would be worried or they would be angry, but then lo and behold, they would actually realize that they could do it, that they could find the answer on their own. And then it might take them five minutes, 10 minutes, it might even take them 15 minutes to do it. But ultimately, they would understand that they're learning. And so, you know, a student this year who said, just tell me what to learn, is now excited and is learning and said, you know what, I can now understand exactly what I need to know in order to balance a chemical equation. And he learned it on his own. I guided him. I 
sort of I gave him a map on how to figure it out, but I wasn't the one telling him how to balance, you know, to balance the which atoms to balance first and, and how to go about doing it. He figured it out on his own. He also figured it out with a buddy. Um, and the smile on his face um, was was uh, priceless. Um, and for the student that just isn't interested in, in anything, and those are the ones that, you know, we, we sort of count as the outliers um, who just aren't interested in, in whatever is going on in the classroom, and if that could be for, you know, emotional reasons or their, you know, stuff's going on outside of school that's just preventing them from doing it. It could also be that they're, um, that they just aren't really interested in the topic um, because their past experiences have really ruined them for the, any type of excitement. Um, and for those students where, I, you know, I've met with them and I said, what are you interested in studying? What are you passionate about? Um, so there, there's one student um, who's been in the school for, uh, since kindergarten and it was a huge milestone that he learned how to read. Um, and then year after year, uh, his creativity, he was fascinated with arts and with origami, his creativity um, was squashed because of the demands of the teachers in the elementary and, and in the middle school to some degree in what he had to do. Um, and it just he just completely shut down. And so I finally pulled him aside and said, what are you interested in? I know that you were interested in art. Would you be interested in learning how to design a website? And he said, sure. So instead of just showing him a program or putting him on Khan Academy, which is a great resource, but I needed something to really hook him. Um, I actually got him in touch with a web designer um, out in uh, the United Kingdom. And she spoke to him for an hour on Google Hangout about what skills he would need in order to be a web designer and how to market himself and what skills he had. Um, and then I also found a, um, another tool called PsychoPaint. Um, by, um, and this allows any, any picture to be uploaded and you can redraw it in one of 15 different artist styles from Monet, Renoir, Picasso. And I had this student play around a little bit with, um, with this tool and then I had him talk to the designer of, of, the, of the program and he learned what it, what it would take to make such a program or a similar program and what skills he would need. And so as a result, this child who basically wouldn't do anything in my class, and it's not just in my class, but it's across the board, it's such limited um, output, he is fully engaged, fully excited, and as a result, he's also, you know, he may not be covering how to get molecular structures together, but he's learning how to design um, a, technolog a technology that is going to help him not only get to his passion, but also help him to relate to others and help him to understand the world around him. And he will eventually get to um, molecular bonding and molecular structures when he goes on to high school, but he will have gotten the push that he needs to understand that, that learning is exciting and that he can learn, that he does have the ability to learn. Um, and, you know, he's doing great work and I, I expect one his final project this year is going to be um, to make a, uh, either a program or a web design um, from the topics that he's studying now um, for the science fair um, and also other topics that he's learned in, in chemistry and physics that he's interested in that he can explain through an artistic venue. Um, and so that, that will be his final project. He doesn't know that yet, um, but that, that will be his final project. And I don't, I don't foresee him resisting that. I think he's going to be really into it. That's a truly an inspirational story, Ariel. It's, it's very rare that you see a student going from maybe what could, might have been considered the bottom rungs of a school or really someone who's struggling and is able to transcend that. Um, and it's, it's very cool to see that that's been part of based learning. And, and then his use of technology and your use of technology were able to transcend some of the struggles that he was having. Um, I, I love that story. I think it's amazing, and I think we can do that for so many more kids around the world. I think there's so many people that fall through the cracks, uh, similar to how this boy might have might have gone down if, if it wasn't for the situation. Um, so we actually have three more questions here. Um, one of them is from a crowd here. One of them is from somebody who, who submitted a question. Her name is Kim Casey. 
And I think we'll finish on that. Um, the question that I'd like to, to ask you, uh, Ariel, right now is what kind of technologies are you using in the classroom and what are you seeing that's succeeding? Maybe you can name uh, three or four of the top resources that you suggest teachers use right now. And then we'll move on to Danny's question. Sure. Um, so I think um, going back to what you said originally in terms of being a connected learner, I think Twitter is a huge resource. Um, I have to thank Sarah Blattner, who's the head of Tom Reitz, for sort of pointing me in that direction. Twitter is a huge resource to connect with other teachers and also with other ed tech companies um, to really grow your personalized learning network. And it also allows you to, it gets you the foot in the door um, to talk to other educators, to get tremendous um, support and resources to bring into the classroom, um, and also reach out to ed tech companies and to say, this is what I'm doing in my classroom, I'd like to try out your program. And 99% of the time they'll say, yep, we want to see how it's going to look in your, in your school, so we're going to give you a, a free option for your classroom to try it out and we want feedback. Um, so that's, you know, Twitter I think is a, is a great resource. In terms of what students are using, um, I use uh, Lesson Paths or MentorMob. Um, which allows me to create playlists of materials for students to learn at home. That's what I use for the flipped model. Um, and I can organize the playlist. I also get analytics on how deep a student has gone into the playlist. Um, I use that both for my eighth graders as well as for the college grad students. Um, another um, technology that I use is, is StudySoup, um, especially with the college students um, in terms of uploading all my uh, the written content, all the textbook stuff that you would normally hand out to, to students, it's up there that they can access on any platform. Um, they can annotate it, highlight it, um, look up words. It's really um, a phenomenal tool and it's the first time that um, students at Hebrew College are using it um, and they love it. Um, you know, they, they threw away their highlighters and they're using the, the software. Um, and they, they feel comfortable because they can access it on their phone, on their tablet, on their laptop. So that's a really cool source. And my eighth graders will be using that um, after the science fair when they use, um, uh, when they start using physics. Um, I guess the last one that I would say that I, that, uh, I would have students use is, is what's called Uja, Y-U-J-A dot com. Um, it's a platform where you can, a teacher can upload a video or questions and students can then comment on it uh, in real time uh, and be able to make comments. Um, so that way instead of showing a video in class um, and either pausing it to answer a student's question or to ask a question of the students, everyone can watch at the same time on his or her own screen or in small groups, answer questions by typing and teachers can also facilitate the questions um, and the learning without necessarily having to pause the movie. Um, or the teacher can pause the movie, and um, it's a it's a great tool um, for um, for learning in the classroom, and also it can be done outside of the classroom, which is great. Makes it flexible. Excellent. I'm sure, I'm sure those resources are going to be very helpful to anybody who's a teacher, an educator, or even a student. Students can become teachers as well. Um, but let's move on to one of Danny Margolis's questions. He asked. What approaches or new attitudes do experienced teachers need to learn before they can succeed with the new tech model? And that's really a great, great question, turning the focus back on the educator. Um, I can answer that, you know, just, just based on some of the things we talked about before. Um, the personal learning network is, is huge. It really, you need to step out there and start developing it. Become a learner yourself. Be curious. And as, as Ariel actually just mentioned, reaching across the aisle to ed tech companies that you're interested in, they're excited to work with you. They would love to hear your voice. So reach across, see what's going on, be curious, develop your personal learning network, and definitely start up on Twitter and become a connected learner. Um, but Ariel, do you have anything to, 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 in response to that that was personal? Um, what, what approaches or attitudes um, did you need to learn before you started succeeding with this model? Um, I think the first thing that I had to um, realize is that I was, I was letting go, and that letting go can feel very scary. Letting go, I mean by letting go of control of what's being taught, how it's being taught, and when it's being taught, um, and really giving control and ownership and responsibility to the students. Um, and the result is that kids are learning um, concepts and skills that they a, probably would never have learned before, and they're learning it more meaningfully. 
Um, so I think that's the, one of the big things I learned. The other piece is that, as I said in the beginning, it's a journey. Um, you know, this is my second year doing, I guess, asynchronous learning, and I have ways to go. I'm constantly seeking um, out information from who, I, from experts, from I could say, from bloggers and from other teachers from Twitter. Um, you know, I, I follow close to 70 blogs, um, and constantly getting. Um, new ideas to pop in and to try. Um, and I think that's also the attitude that you, just, you have to try and see what happens. And if it flops, it doesn't mean that it was a failure. It means that that's, it, it, it happens. Um, it is what it is. And you can learn from it. And what, what can be learned from it? And what takeaways can you understand from it? And it's also a good role model for, for students to understand that, it, that making mistakes is part of learning, that it's not a negative. Um, unfortunately, many of our kids and also adults feel that when they make a mistake, it's, it's, it's bad, um, and it lowers morale, and it lowers self-confidence. But making mistakes is how we learn. Um, you know, Thomas Edison it took him thousands of attempts to actually get the light bulb to actually work for more than 10 seconds. Um, you know, but that's not what's talked about. What's talked about is that he created the light bulb. He didn't just sit and create it, you know, the first time. It took him thousands of times, thousands of trials. Um, and the same thing here. It's okay if it takes you know, if it takes you a month to understand how Twitter works, you're not missing the boat. You're, you're getting on the boat. You're on that train, as, a, as my former head of school used to say. Um, you're on that train. And as long as you keep moving forward and pushing forward, um, you're just going to be a better teacher, and you're going to be, which is going to be better for your kids. I love that you want to risk and the learning opportunity. And that's completely right. We need to be comfortable being students ourselves. And, and take those risks and, and explore because we can do that side by side with our students. And at the end of the day, that's exactly what education is about. And Keith even said, a mistake is only a mistake when you keep repeating it. A mistake is a learning opportunity, and that's that's absolutely right. I think I think that's great. Um, the last question that we're going to touch upon is actually something that uh, Kim. Casey actually asked it before the presentation started. And I think it's a great way to, to wrap up our conversation here. Um, her question is, why should technology be an important part of any le lesson? Is technology a necessary component for today's students to experience any lesson? Why or why not? And if your child has a teacher who's not using technology, um, how would you handle it as a parent or um, do you really feel like technology enhances a lesson, fosters critical thinking skills? And I think that's a great question because it, it covers a, a lot of the things that, that we discussed today here with Ariel. And, and uh, you know, I can answer it personally, and, and then Ariel, I would love to hear what you think as far as is it a necessity to use technology in a classroom, and how can it really help students? Um, and is it required, of course? So. My response is, is, of course, the use of technology is not a requirement. And it's really a case-by-case -case basis. Um, oftentimes, you can use technology to enhance any lesson, any project, or anything that you're really working on. At the end of the day, technology is really becoming something that's um, omnipresent. Internet's going to be omnipresent. And it is, uh, it is a good service to our students and our fellow learners to have them surrounded and very comfortable and fluid in the interaction with these mediums, but it's not necessary. And it doesn't have to be present everywhere. But do keep in mind that any lesson that you have can be more connected. It can be more collaborative. And that's really where you can bring in technology. And that's what we talked about previously. You know, if you need to be more collaborative, if you need to open up new doors for your students to interact with new people, then this is a great way to do it. And you can use technology to do so. Um, Ariel, what do you think in response to this question? Um, I think your answer it was great. I mean, I think is technology necessary in the classroom? No, it's not necessary in the classroom. Does it enhance the learning? Absolutely. Um, but again, that's all dependent on the structure of the class, uh, which is founded by the teacher. Um, you know, you said in the beginning that you don't have a lot of information on your slides because you wanted to share stories. And sharing stories is one of the best ways that we learn. I mean, it's, before we had written language, that's how we, we remembered facts was through oral communication. Um, and, you know, telling stories that are meaningful um, to a student is, 
much better than having them look at a screen and looking at drill and kill um, problems for math. There's a time and place for those, for those drill and kill. I'm not saying that they're not useful. They definitely are. But there's a time and place for them. Um, but I think that technology can only enhance the learning experiences of the students. And, and also from, you know, from an outsider, from a, someone who consults with several technologies, technology is here to stay. It's, be, it's, it's everywhere. Um, you can't run away from it. I mean, you know, unless you're going to you know, live, in, live in the woods like in a hermit and be isolated, um, which is something that we don't want. It's actually one of the core components of the Common Core that there's social reasoning, that we want people to be able to communicate with one another. Um, and so technology allows for all that. I, and I would say to, um, you know, as a parent, if it were my child and, and, the, and the teacher was not using technology, um, I would want to talk with the teacher and find out how that teacher is engaging the students and meeting the needs of all the students in the classroom and the goals and what the philosophy is of the teacher. Um, and then to also say, well, you know, perhaps the teacher could use, would you mind using this particular type of technology? It doesn't have to be that everyone's on a Chromebook. It could be sharing a, you know, an audio story of, Shel Silverstein's home that Shel Silverstein is reading aloud, um, that, the act, that the author is actually reading. The teacher isn't reading it, but the author is reading it. And that's going to be a totally different experience for that child than to hear the teacher reading it. Um, and then there can be a discussion as to why, the, why you know, Mr. Silverstein used um, a particular choice of word or a tone when he was reading. Um, whereas the teacher, you know, so therefore, but it's all about letting go. And for a lot of teachers, that's the biggest fear. And so, but as a parent, I think you have a right to go to your child's teacher and to have that conversation because technology is everywhere. And it's not replacing teachers. Um, they're enhancing us and they're changing our roles from being the, the experts to being the guides. Um, and I think that that's, um, the biggest takeaway and, and the biggest opportunity for teachers so that, and it doesn't matter the age either. Um, you know, it, it can only enhance your, your, the learning experience that is going on both for your students as well as for yourself. Thank you so much, Ariel. And, and that pretty much concludes what we're, what we're discussing today, that the powerful message of using technology to enhance what you do to become more connected to take your class and your learning experience to the next level. I mean, that's been our goal today, and I really appreciate everyone from all around the world participating today. Um, thank you so much. It's, it's really fantastic. And uh, please do tweet at us, at Sieva Kaczynski or at Ariel Margolis. We have a list of useful resources. We're happy to share this presentation with you. Um, if you tweet at us, or you can send us an email at info at studysuit.com, and we'll share it with you. Other than that, thank you so much again, and uh, everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you, Steve. All righty. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you very much, Steve and Ariel. And if people would like to, uh, uh, to show their appreciation, um, you can use the, uh, the hand clapping there, the little smiley face at the top, and um, uh, just a, a, a bit of applause for, uh, for their efforts. Thank you very much. Uh, for those people who want to save the slides, uh, you can go up to the File menu and come down to Save and you can save the whiteboard. Now the trick when saving the whiteboard is to save it as a PDF file. Do not save it as a whiteboard file. You can equally save the entire chat conversation and uh, that will save as a text file and that way you'll have any links and comments that we'll put in there as well. So, but again, thank you Siva and Ariel and uh, that concludes the session.